Well, good evening and welcome to our chronological teaching through the Bible. It's Mystery Baptist Church on this Wednesday night and also thank you uh, for joining us. If you are listening on the app or listening to one of the archives, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to start. I realized that last week we went through, um, you were planning on being here, and or I was planning on being here, and perhaps you were planning on being here, and you did, and we didn't do that teaching. So, Brother David, thank you for your uh, for filling in uh, again. I appreciate that. Um, we are going to start at the beginning, and over the next 30 minutes, we're going to go through this chronologically. You're reading in the bulletin. If you follow through, you should be through, I think, chapter 6 today. Uh, is it all the way through 6? Is that correct? What's that say there? I don't have a bulletin with me, but uh, just through Wednesday. Okay, so I think that's going to take you, if I'm not mistaken, going to take you probably through Seth, uh, the birth of Seth, Adam, Adam's son Seth, but we're probably not going to go that far in this lecture today. We're going to talk uh, uh, as far as we can, and then we're going to stop at the, at the 8 o'clock time, and we'll pick back up there next week. So today as we go through this, we're looking at the beginning. Now, many of you have heard or read the beginning, and hopefully if you haven't read, pick up a bulletin and read the rest of the week so you can follow along with us. Um, you've heard about the beginning of creation and humanity, the story of the beginning of creation, the story of humanity. Now, the Bible is not the beginning of God. See, God, remember, has no beginning. It's hard to wrap our head around that, but He has no beginnings. He always existed. God has always been there. But the Bible begins with God. In fact, Genesis 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is not in the beginning of God, but it's in the beginning of the creation of the heavens and the earth, the universe as we know it. It's, it's kind of a what I call a brain versus faith thing. And I mentioned that last, I mentioned that, um, I think I, when I did the introduction, I mentioned that a couple weeks ago. A brain versus faith thing. God had no beginning, for he always existed. Well, the reason I call that a brain versus um, faith thing is because I can't wrap my head around that. My brain doesn't work that way. I just can't get it. So I have to do faith. I have to put that on faith that God has always existed. It's hard for me as a creature who was created to have an understanding of something that has always been. And you're probably the same way. So when we go into the beginning in this uh, God creating the world... In Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 4, we, we see four important characters. We see God, we see Adam, we see Eve, and we see Satan. Now, the view that God created the world is not in competition with science. I, I want that to be clear to you, because sometimes we think that it's in competition with science. It's really not in competition with science. It's not even in competition with evolution, it's in conflict or competition with any world view, though. Any view that argues that we had, do not have a creator. So evolution as a big bang theory that starts and out of nothing becomes something without the, uh, without the role or the interaction of a creator, then that world view would be in competition with the beginning. But see, evolution is more about the process. And, and the reason we can look at evolution and we can look at... Now, I'm not talking about evolution as in that's where we came from as monkeys. But evolution is in the process of continual evolvement. Things changing over time. But they've been designed to change over time by the Creator. Are you with me? So that's the point that I want you to understand is that they kind of can go hand in hand when talking about the way things are being changed over time. For example... Evolution, mere evolution would be a river flowing through uh, an area. If you go down on the Altima Hall after a big flood, what happens? After the waters recede, you see the, where the waters have eroded. Trees are falling into the river. Every river has that happen if it has trees on it as it branches out and makes uh, the banks erode the banks. That's just that's part of the evolutionary process for the river as it changes the scenery around it. So nobody is saying that one day we were not, and then one day we were, and then it was just amazing. I, I was driving today, and I was thinking about this, and I thought to myself, how can anybody in their right mind honestly think that as intelligent as we are, that we came out of pond scum? Now, I know some people who remind me of pond scum, 
But how could we, just kidding, how could we think that, that all of the creation we have and the, and the intelligence that we have and the technology that we have, that, that just our bodies and how they work and how they intertwine and how, they, how you can, I mean, look, I don't know if you're good at packing, but you unpack my intestines and it stretches really far, doesn't it? It's some crazy stuff and it got in here. And you might look at me and say, well, I got more intestines than my wife. That's not true. We have the same amount of intestines. I just have more donuts than my wife. But we all have uh, bodies that are intricately made by someone. And that someone we know because the scriptures teach us is God. So I want you to understand that the view of God creating the heavens and the earth, um, the biblical worldview of that, the biblical worldview of God creating the heavens and the earth is the origin, the beginning. Now, there are some other ancient stories that I want to talk to you about. And remember, you need to read your Bibles this week because I'm not going to come in here and read it to you. This is not like Sunday morning where we go verse by verse or section by section. What I'm doing here is I'm kind of unpacking some other things that that the Scriptures give uh, way to. But there are some other ancient civilizations that wrote down their own accounts of how the world was created. I was going to share a couple of these with you. The best known is the Babylonian adaptation of the Sumerian story called Enuma Elish. Uh, The gods, now I'm going to try to pronounce these gods' names right, so if I offend any of you Babylonians, don't uh, hold it against me. The gods Tiamat and Apsu existed from the beginning. But after other gods were born, Apsu tried to do away with them. There's this battle between those gods, and, and these are little G gods. And so one of the gods, Ea, Killed Apsu. I wouldn't want to worship a God that could be killed. Would you? I just got up here and sang with the group, God's Not Dead Sunday. I, I'd kind of make that song, have to change that song if God could die, wouldn't it? So Ea killed Apsu, and then Tiamat was killed herself. And, and uh, or, I mean, excuse me, she, she killed the order of the stars and the sun and the moon. And lastly, to free the gods from the menial task with her help, he created mankind from clay and mingled it together with the blood of King Gu, a rebel god who had led Tiamat's forces. Boy, that's exciting, isn't it? I like Lord of the Rings, too. You know, I, I, Harry Potter was a fun story. These are not really true stories, but they're creation stories that we have in history of civilizations making up this is how it happened. Other creations found in Babylonian, record, rec, uh, Babylonian records include the epic of Atrahasis. Is that how you say that? Me either, I, but I bet you that ain't it. Uh, describes the creation of man as a solution to relieve the work of gods. You know, gods were having to cultivate the land, and so this story says that they created man to do the cultivating because the gods were too tired. I love Greek mythology. I actually uh, loved it in school, loved studying Zeus and 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 uh, and and Aphrodite and um, what's the what's the one of the of the ocean uh, uh, Poseidon yeah and Euphrates no I just made that one up um, those are those are all exciting stories to me but they're not rooted in truth but can I just say this can you just can you see for a second this is heresy in a lot of churches but I'm gonna say it. can you see how people out there struggle with the truth of the Bible when other ancient civilizations have their own creation stories? We have to look at the difference. The difference is God created us to have a relationship with Him. He didn't create us to do the work. He didn't create us because there was a war and a battle that, I mean, I guess there was a disagreement. There are some similarities. But everything comes back to His love for His people. His love for His people. He's not one of many gods. His creation of humanity was not a matter of convenience. It was an act of love. God created humans to have a relation with Him and not a relationship and not just to do the work that He didn't want to do. So there's the day-by-day creation that you read about in Genesis. Day one, light. So that there would be light and darkness. Day two, the sky and water, which is where the waters are separated. Because you know why we say the waters are separated? Because we got water on the ground, and guess what? We got water in the sky, don't we? Yep, we're going to get some of that later on in this week. You'll get some of that water in the sky. For those of you who think I'm making things up, land and seas on day three, 
The waters were gathered, vegetation began to spring up. On day four, the sun and the moon and the stars used to govern the day, the night, to mark seasons, years, days. Beautiful. How else would we know when to get up or go to bed or what day it was? We have the sun and the moon and the stars to help do that. And and, then, hey, the sun and the moon and the stars, they do so much more than just mark the days on the calendar, don't they? He created fish and birds to fill the water in the sky on day five. On day six, the rest of the animals to fill the earth and man and woman to care for the earth and to have relationship and communion with God. We're going to talk about man and woman in a minute. Animals, uh, or excuse me, on the seventh day, he rested. He rested. And you know what else he did? He declared that all that he had made was what? Very good. That's right. It was good. So this is the, the story about God creating. See, it's, it's so much more than just reading Genesis 1 again through 2 or 1 through. You know, it's, it's about the creator creating all of this because he created or was going to create at the sixth day a people, a, a, a being that he loved. You know, when he was creating, listen to this now, when he was creating the fish and the birds, separating the waters from the sky and the ground, putting the stars in the sky, getting the moon and the sun together, when he was speaking these things in existence and creating stuff, you know what? He had you in mind. He had you in mind. He was doing this for you. You walk out tonight and look around in the sky and Say, man, this is beautiful. Look at the stars. Or look at the moon. Or I, I love the, when it's a full moon and you can go out and it looks like it's, I mean, it looks like somebody dimmed the sun. And you can see across the yard or across the street or down the road. He did that for you. He didn't do it just because he was bored. He did it because he knew you would appreciate it in some way. And he, he wanted you to have it. Y'all, you got to go out of here tonight looking at the things that God has done for you and did at the beginning. When you get in that car of yours and you drive home, roll your window down. Even if your hair is going to get messed up, don't worry about it. You're going home. Roll your window down. Stick your arm out that window. Smell the air. Feel the warmth. Hear the animals, the birds, whatever it is. And think, God made that for me. That's pretty cool. I don't know if anybody's ever done anything for me like that. You know, people say, "What I said Sunday, what have you done for me lately? That's, that's what he's done for me. That's what he's done for you. So it all is beautiful. Until Adam and Eve. But we'll get to them. Let's talk about Adam. Here's Adam in his prime. We don't know what that looks like, but I can imagine. I can imagine that because there was no Krispy Kreme, Adam was skinny. Right? I can imagine that because he was working the grounds, he was, you know, or because he was out there doing whatever it was he was doing, I don't even know what he was doing, but he was probably fit. Just taking some liberties here, I don't know. I just can't help but I'm just gonna I'm gonna paint a picture you probably don't want to see, but I just I can't help but think that if I stand in the mirror and I take off my shirt and I look at myself in the mirror, that somehow that's not what Adam looked like. You know, maybe not. Maybe it is. Maybe that's what that tree had. We all think it was fruit. Maybe the fruit was a donut. I don't know. Maybe that's where sin came from. But let me tell you some good things about Adam. Adam was the first zoologist. He was the first zoologist. He was the first one to deal with animals. Can can you imagine naming the animals? I can't imagine spending time naming them. I I, I just, when I think about how God classified the animals, He classified them in habitats. Fish of the water, birds of the air, right? Now we got all these other scientific things. But imagine Him, you know, He said, this is a spider. I don't know why, but... I guess she'll die. This is a spider. This is a snake. Whatever that looks, snake might have looked different. This is a lizard. This is a giraffe. This is an elephant. Here's what you do. Go to the zoo. Go to the zoo. Go to the circus. Go somewhere where you can get up close to these 
humongous elephants and ask yourself, is there a God? Go out on the rivers and throw a line in, catch a fish, hold the fish up and go, is there a God? Look at the fish, look at the intricacies. It, it can breathe underwater. Is there a God? So Adam was, I mean, Adam got, he got, that must have been one heck of a day. Yeah, yeah, shh, yeah. He says, not, you're not Teresa, you can't shout out in here. <laughs> you can tell her I said that. Too. No, you're right, he was, he was very intelligent. Very intelligent. I mean, if you were a zoologist, you have to be intelligent, right? Very smart, very wise. He was the first landscape architect. He was placed in the garden to what? Care for it. I want you to know Adam. That's why I'm telling you this. Some of you are like, why are we telling us? I want you to know him. When I talk about him in church, I don't have time to tell you on Sunday morning all about this. I want you to know Adam. Adam, no last name. I want you to know him. I don't know if he had a a last name or not. Probably not. Why would he need one? Do you think he and Eve got confused in the beginning? You know, (laughs) will you take my last name, Eve? Why? He was the father of the human race. Black, white, red, brown. Jesus loves the little children of the world. He was the father of the human race. Adam was the first human. You and I are related to Adam and to each other. Slide away from your spouse a little bit and look at him weird. You and I are related. And your marriage is weird. First person who was made in the image of God. The first human to share an intimate, personal relationship with God. One of my favorite hymns is In the Garden. It paints such a beautiful picture of how he walked with Adam. That's what I think of anyway. Maybe that's not what the author intended, but that's what I think of how he walked in the garden. Scripture says he walked in the cool of the day. Can you imagine? First of all, this was perfect. It was the Garden of Eden. How even better would the cool of the day have been? The hot of the day would have been pretty good, huh? It was a garden of Eden. And he was right there with them. I mean, sometimes God feels distant. But this relationship before the fall was intimate, was beautiful. It was amazing. I dare say, though, Jesus has rectified the problem that sin caused. We will never truly appreciate the intimacy with God until heaven. I believe that. Now, there were some weaknesses and mistakes because God gave Adam free will. So Adam sounded like a pretty perfect guy so far, didn't he? He sounded like a pretty perfect guy. He's pretty cool, man. He was on top of things. But he was a man who had free will, and he messed it up. Women, great chance to say amen. You missed it. He avoided responsibility. Now, some of y'all do this, right? Some people do this, right? Be careful. So let's see how much you have in common with Adam. He avoided responsibility. He blamed others. He chose to hide rather than to love. He chose to hide rather than to confront. He made excuses rather than admitting the truth. And his greatest mistake was when he and Eve brought sin into the world, disobeying God. Do you, I've told this before, it's just so, I love it, I just have to tell it again. Some of you haven't heard this. I can imagine the conversation in the Garden of Eden when God comes up and he asks the rhetorical question, have you eaten from the tree? He knew the answer, he's God. But Adam says, the woman that you put here, right? Adam, I mean, he had already sinned. He was going to start casting blame on other people. First thing he did was he blamed God, he blamed woman. Now, how many times have we done that? How many times have we blamed someone else and God for something we did? And that's what he did. He said, the woman that you put here. So basically he said, hey, this is between y'all. You put her here, she did it. I'm just caught in the middle, y'all work it out. And we're going to talk about Eve in a minute because she didn't miss a beat. She said, mm-mm, that serpent over there, he's the one that did this. 
You see the sinful nature of people, the sinful nature of humans, immediately, immediately cast in the blame. This is stuff kids do to each other in young age. We, they, they refer to it as, she started it. All right? That's, but isn't that what it is? That's what it is. She started it. He started it. We got that going on at my house. Andrew and Ava. They'll get into it. And, and you know what I say? He started it. She started it. Well, I'm finishing it. That's what I tell them. But that's sin. Now, when there are people like Adam who do things like Adam did, God provides us an opportunity to learn from that, doesn't he? So tonight, let's learn from Adam's life. Because as Adam's descendants, we all reflect the image of God. Although the image of God has been messed up, the image we were created and messed up by sin, we still reflect some of the image of God. And we could go down, and we're not going to, but we could go down a list and break down all of the characteristics. But for the sake of argument, let's just trust that the spiritual side of us is part of the reflection of the character of God. Adam also teaches us that God wants people who, though free to do wrong, choose instead to love him. See, it wouldn't mean anything to me. And I don't think it'd mean anything to God. If He put me on this earth with you and we didn't have a choice to do the wrong thing. I mean, how how good is it really for us to be made to do the right thing? Is God going to be excited about that? Is God going to take pleasure in a relationship that... We're not choosing to have, but he's forcing us to have. How many of you would like to be forced into a relationship? In fact, how many of you would feel if, 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 if I came up to you and I said to you, this is why I believe the church needs to be really good about checking on members. When you know somebody's not been in your Sunday school class for two or three weeks, give them a call. Find out where they are. Make sure they're okay. Because when the teacher of the class, or the pastor of the church does it, some people will go, well, that's the pastor or the teacher. Uh, Another example is when people come in, when guests come in, I've I've seen it happen more than once. I've seen it happen here, I've seen it happen other places. People will, will come in, visitors, guests for the first time will come in, and if the pastor or a deacon or a youth pastor or a music leader or somebody like that, that is easily identifiable in that position, speaks to them, it doesn't count. Because they're expected to. They could have five staff members speak to them, five leaders speak to them, and nobody else speak to them, and they'll leave out of here and they'll say, nobody spoke to me. I've had that happen here. In fact, one time I said, yeah, I do. I, I, know, I can name three people that spoke to you, and I named me and two others, and I was told, as God is my witness, well, yeah, but that doesn't count. Well, I won't say hi to you next time. See, people expect pastors and leaders to do that. So if God created us and we didn't get to choose to have a relationship, it would be really meaningless because he would have made us have a relationship. Can I, can I just go ahead and say right now so that everybody can hear me on the stream and off the stream, you'll not hear me say that God created some to go to heaven and some to go to hell for that very reason. Because there's not a genuine relationship with him if he's forcing you to have it. Now, if you want to know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about Calvinism. Okay? I'm a bookend Calvinist. And now we don't have time to get into that right now. Just trust me when I say that. And I've actually been taking some of my discipleship men in the early morning, uh, Sunday mornings through that stuff, and they're starting to get, you know, the other day we were in a council meeting, and when we got done with the council meeting, you know what Matthew said? He said, I'm just excited that I understood what you guys were talking about this time. Because we've been taking them through that. So next year, men, I take January off. and in Fe- I mean, I'll be here, but I take it off the discipleship group. And in February, I'll start another 11 months with a group of men. And you should sign up for that. You meet every Sunday morning, almost or so, at 8 o'clock. And we go through a whole bunch of stuff. And right now, they're having to do some theology classes online. I'm making them do that Hillsdale College theology class. Which really everybody should do. I say I'm making them. I don't really make them. I ask them to do it. We'll find out if they did it. We just started. 
But it's important that we recognize the relationship we have with God here. Okay, so we learn from Adam that we should not blame each other or others for our faults. Adam should have said, yeah, God, I did. I mean, you already know that I did, but yeah, God, I did. I ate from the fruit. I ate from the tree. I did. And we also learn from Adam we cannot hide from God. God comes into the garden. Where are you? I, I, it's, it's like this. God knows where they are. The other day I went into the restroom at our house. And I, I walked in there and I noticed on the wall is a, a little, looks like kind of a weird looking little triangle with a little in black. And then it's smeared like if somebody tried to erase it but didn't do a very good job. Well, I come to find out, I thought it was marker. Come to find out it was eyeliner. Now I know, I'm almost positive that Heather did not do that. And I'm pretty sure Andrew did not do that. But I sure enough went to Ava and stood right there while Heather said, Do you know who did that? We know who did that. It was Ava. It was rhetorical. That's the same thing God did when he went in the garden. He had already known. He knew. In fact, you want to get real deep, he knew it was going to happen before it happened. At least with this drawing on the wall, I was surprised. Not pleasantly, mind you, but I was surprised. We can't hide from God. I say that because we learn that from the very first human. That we can't hide from God. So why do we try to hide from God? I can't help but say that without being excited and yelling. It's one of those things that just get, it makes me... It, it's, there's a word, and I learned that this word is not a cuss word. For the longest time, I was afraid to say the word asinine. So I found out that's not a bad word. Did you know that? You can say that. You're welcome. I thought it was bad because it sound, you know, started with a... Well, you know. It's crazy is what that word means. It's crazy for us to think that we can hide from God. Yet... We lie, we cheat, we steal. Somebody says, I've never stolen a day in my life. Maybe not physically or tangibly, but did you steal company time? Did you sit there and ride the clock for 30 minutes? That would be stealing company time. Some of y'all are like, oh, I better quit doing it. I'm, I'm not, I'm just, I've, I've done it. I'm just telling you. When you're on the clock and you're hourly and you know you got to be there till 5 o'clock and you're done with your work at a quarter till, you know you'll sit there and do something else. Right? Take lunch a little extra. Amazes me what people do. and they Christians. Christians. See, see, I like being a pastor. I get to be on call 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. So I mean, JD came by the other day and I was cutting grass. I thought for sure you were going to stop and help me, but JD just waved and kept on driving. So I don't mind if I go home early because I know I'm going to stay late, right? But some of y'all are hourly. You've got to keep that time clock in there. Guess what? God sees that. God sees that. He sees the heart. He knows what your motives are. How about the people who, Christians who don't tithe? Well, that's nobody's business but me and God. Well, that's great. God knows. <laughs> All right? I'm not just saying. I'm just throwing that out there. Well, I... Nobody's business whether I read my Bible every day. Well, guess what? God knows. You get the point. I, sometimes I want to just go through every single thing that I know you're not doing. But you get the point. Apply that to all of it. All right. We're going to wrap up with this vital statistics so you know Adam. Coming up next time, we're going to talk about Eve. We're going to talk about Cain. We're going to talk about Abel. Because Cain and Abel are the children, the first children of Adam and Eve. And so we're going to talk about the first murder and the first Jealousy and the first covetousness, which will go in jealousy, and the first big sin, if you want to classify it as big. This Garden of Eden is where this took place. Adam was living there. He was a caretaker. I mentioned a gardener. He was a farmer. He had Eve as his wife, Cain, Abel, Seth, and then he has numerous other children. Dude lived to be over 900 years old. You ever heard anybody stand in this pulpit and say, dude, about Adam? You're going to be surprised on Wednesday nights, Dave. There's a lot of stuff coming you've never heard. Hallelujah. <laughs> it ain't real theological, but there's a lot of stuff coming you've never heard. And you said hallelujah. That's the first. There you go. Me either. Me either. 
And guess the, get, get, get this. Adam is the first person, first man, to never, well, first person, to never have an earthly mother or father. So let me ask you a question. Do you think Adam had a belly button? I'm going to leave that with you tonight. Why don't you go home and think about, did Adam have a belly button? You better think about what a belly button's for before you answer that. It's interesting because getting to know Adam and getting to know Eve and getting to know Cain and Abel and then getting to know Seth and getting to see the genealogy We're going to see how we get to the flood of Noah. We're going to see how God wipes out everybody and saves a handful of Noah's family. And we're going to see eventually how you and I have come to be because of Adam's creation, because of Noah being spared. All those tribes, and you know what? what? The Muslims, Middle Eastern Muslims, They come from a tribe in the Bible. And we're going to talk about all that. So until next week, may God bless you. Father, may your word speak. May this desire to grow enhance in all of us. And may you bless us as we go until the next time we come together. In Jesus' name, amen.